30 years back, you were involved in the first kind of climate studies, right, at Oak Ridge? That's true. Well, 40 years ago. What, what was the goal back then, and who were the people involved in the project? Well, the leader was Alvin Weinberg, who was the director of Oak Ridge Laboratory, and he was by training a physicist, but he was very much interested in climate in a much broader view, and he was also interested in biology, so we had there a good collection of people who were experts in various fields. I mean, there was, I forget all their names. Ray Frotti was the uh, keeper of the information. He had the best information about forests and, and plants and, and soil and uh, the atmosphere, uh, everything that was measured. So we, we tried to measure everything and to, to see what the effects of carbon dioxide really are in the real world. Which year was it? So I was there, I think, around 1970 to 1980. I forget the dates. But anyhow, um, so this was a very active group of not just climate experts, but eco 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 ecology experts looking at the whole natural world seeing what the effect of carbon dioxide would be. And I think that we did a good job. Then there was another group of people, mostly in Colorado, who did computer calculations, looking at the climate from a theoretical point of view. And they, so they did beautiful computer calculations looking at effects of <coughs> effects of carbon dioxide on temperature and rainfall. And then, of course, there became a political fight which of these groups would get the money. And so, in the end, everything is decided, of course, by who gets the money. And, and, and so the people in Colorado won. And ever since then, the people, the climate experts, the computer experts, have had the money and they have also had all the public attention. And uh, the group at Oak Ridge, for various reasons, has dissolved. And I mean, I think there's still people there, but uh, any, the people I knew, of course, are not there anymore. And Why not? Well, that's 40 years ago. They, they either retired or disappeared. And mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know now what they are doing. Anyway, I got out of the field when it became political. So I haven't worked on the subject actively, but of course I'm interested in what they're doing. And, and so particularly in the last 10 years, I've been reading the literature and now it's become, I would say, a scandal that so many people are telling lies. And but why do you think it's dangerous to believe in computer and the, these fluid models? Because they're wrong. It's it's very simple. They're wrong, and and still people believe in them. You base your opinion on that they are wrong. They, they disagree with the observations. And, I mean, nature ought to be the deciding voice. The observations always should tell you in the end who is right and who is wrong. And those people don't look at the observations. They are in a world of their own. And, and We should look at it more holistically, like an organic thing that you can't model the world? Right, that, that a world is much more complicated than the computer models. I have a good friend in Princeton who is a computer expert. Sukuro Manabe is his name, and he's Japanese, but he lives here in Princeton. And he he did some of the first climate, climate models with enriched carbon dioxide. 
And he always said from the beginning, the climate model is a very good tool for understanding climate, but a very bad tool for predicting climate. And that's still true, and I mean, he understands it. And so what the reason is that what the computer models can do is to vary one thing at a time, which is, of course, wonderful for science. You varied one thing at a time, carbon dioxide or whatever you like, and then you, with the computer model, you can see directly what the effect of that is. So that's understanding what's going on. It's very helpful, but if you look at the real world, there are hundreds of different things going on all the time, and you can the computer model can't possibly give you a complete picture. Computer model essentially it's just fluid dynamics. It's just the computer model gives a good model for the motion of the air in the atmosphere, the motion of the water in the ocean. That's all it can do. With all the other things like trees and clouds and hail and snow and all the fine details, the models cannot do. And but do you say that that the whole history of global warming is based on fluid models, computer models, and less on observation? Yes, I think that is true. It is uh, it's sort of an, an accident that it happened that way. Well, you can almost name it a subsidized truth. That is the problem, yes. It is a subsidized truth that the the people who are believing the models but then I, I don't say they're dishonest, but I think they they are inevitably influenced by the fact that they live by scaring the public. That uh, if they did not scare the public, they wouldn't get support from the government. The military does the same thing. I mean, I think they're very much like the military. In, 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 in mil How do you think? Well, the military also lives by scaring the public. But I mean, they're honest people. I like the people, military people I talk to. They are good people. They are honest people, and they understand war is terrible. And they don't enjoy fighting wars, but they still there. But their existence depends on scaring the public, and so that's what they do. And and. Anyhow, I, that's my, so I would say that it's a similar problem. Obviously, we're living in an era where we're pushing major changes in terms of fighting global warming, uh, reducing carbon dioxide. Um, in East Germany, a lot of farmers are getting huge pressure by loans they need to get to produce biofuels, bioenergy. Um, my question to you is, are we are we saving the world or missing the point? Yeah, I would say missing the point. But uh, I mean, roughly speaking, there are two totally different things going on in the natural world. There is effects of carbon dioxide on the climate, which everybody talks about, and there are the ecological effects of carbon dioxide, which have nothing to do with climate, which nobody talks about. And they should, they're totally separate and different. And in, in, in the case of the climate effects, it is a very complicated set, set of problems. We don't understand climate. Climate is 
very complicated and we are only beginning to understand what the effects may be and they may be good or they may be bad, but it's not clear. And, but if you look at the non-climate effects of carbon dioxide, they are evident, they are very, very strong, they are easy to observe, they are easy to measure, they are overwhelmingly beneficial. Can you give me an example? The carbon dioxide directly enables the growth of all kinds of plants. So more carbon dioxide means it's good for the wildlife, it's good for the forests, and it's good for food, it's good for the agriculture all over the world. It saves huge numbers of people from starving. It, it is in, it just out of all proportion more serious than the effects of climate. Are you saying carbon dioxide is good for plants, good for growth, good, good for making the, the world a greener place? Right. Uh, what, what if we're reducing carbon dioxide? No, it would be very harmful. And uh, the, 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 the great thing about carbon dioxide is besides producing growth of plants directly, it also makes them more resistant to drought because carbon dioxide is a substitute for water. If you look at the way a plant actually breathes, it has little holes in the surface of the leaf which can open and shut. And every time that the carbon dioxide molecule comes into the plant from the air, a hundred molecules of water escape. That you can't avoid that. So that absorbing carbon dioxide always implies losing water. But if the air outside is poorer in carbon dioxide, then the plant will lose more water in order to breathe. So in fact, you're making the plant more susceptible to drought. And that's the great killer of plants, of course. It does it. So you're turning green land into deserts by doing that. So what you're saying is that due to carbon dioxide, the world is actually getting greener. Yes, it is getting greener. That's measurable. And it, it has measured. Yes. Uh, you know, this idea that we should preserve nature as much as we can and preserve rare species and preserve forests and all that to me is very good. And, and, but the idea that we can stop climate change is absurd. We, just, we don't know enough even to imagine really how to do that. But the, the, the word pollution, of course, implies a sort of moral judgment. But in fact, CO2 is good for us. It's good for the plants. It's good for the food. And CO2 is not a pollutant. It's actually a fertilizer. And most of the time for the history of the Earth, CO2 was much higher than it is now. We, I mean, the world is at the moment is sort of halfway starved for not enough carbon dioxide. The vegetation would like it better if there were three times as much. And we know humans have been putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that is sure. And we know that the carbon dioxide has gone up by 30% during the last hundred years. And that's due to human activity, that's quite clear. The question as to well, what effect that has had on the climate is not clear. And whether the carbon dioxide actually caused the warming, we don't know. There is certainly there has been some warming, not as much as most people said there would be, and, but still it is, certainly it's real. And, the, and there's an, a whole other kind of question, which is whether the warming is actually harmful or helpful. I actually went to Ulisat, Il, 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 Ilulisat, which is a place in Greenland where Al Gore went to make his film. And 
So the film of Al Gore, The Inconvenient Truth, of course, was a great propaganda film claiming to show the bad effects of global warming. So if you, he went to Ilulisat because that's the place where global warming is most spectacular. It's, a, it's the place on the planet where global warming is strongest. It is all correct. The pictures are all true, and the, the, you can see the ice falling into the ocean and the great, great rivers flowing down from the ice. So and it really is warming there, there's no question. But I also talk to the people who live there, and they love it. They are very happy that it's warming. <laughs> They would like to like it to continue, and so for them it is actually a great benefit. The best of not only it saves them from getting drowned in the old times. The only way they could live was by fishing, and fishing in that part of the world is very dangerous. So one third of the young men would be getting drowned because of accidents at sea and. Now they don't need to go fishing because they have tourists. <laughs> so for them it's a much better life than it was before. There are some places where the warming is doing harm and other places where it's doing good. But certainly I would say on the average more good than harm. And the, the water is rising, right? The sea levels are rising. It is true. On the other hand, it has been rising for 10,000 years. It seems that it's not been rising more rapidly in the last 20, 20 years than it, than it was before. It seems to be fairly steady and slow, which can be serious, but it's not a disaster. And the trouble is a lot of it is due to sinking land rather than rising ocean. The sinking land comes to, is, is from human activity, it's mostly from humans pumping water out of the land. As a result, the land sinks. And that's actually more serious than the rising ocean. But are there things we can do to control the sea levels, for example? That we don't know. I, I, I think the answer is we simply don't know. It, it's, uh, at, at the moment, we certainly don't know how to do it. Mm. We, we don't know how much of the sea level rise is natural and how much is due to us. And it's certainly, it, it's still quite small anyway. Uh, why do we not see it in the mainstream media? I don't quite know the answer to that. For some reason, the media always loved disasters. Disasters, as they used to say, sell newspapers, or they also sell television. And well, as good news does not sell. And Here's my point. I'm 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 an average person living a middle class life, an average guy. Yes. Sort of overwhelmed by a labyrinth of information, whether that is left winged or right winged, but all are claiming a monopoly on the truth. And how can I, as an average guy, sort of choose my own truth? It's difficult. You have to make use of whatever you have in the way of inf information. Uh, the media are very biased, and very often wrong. I can't tell you a, 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 a source of information that's guaranteed to be correct. Generally speaking, I mean, you, there are two kinds of information. There is observations and there are theories. And so generally speaking, you can believe the observations and you don't have to believe the theories. And I think that's the most useful guide. The observations of the greening of the planet are very clear. The theories of climate are very confused. You, you obviously living a very blessed age, 
Yes. I'm, I'm not even half the man you are <laughs> yeah. in terms of life experience. Uh, how do you cope with it? And how can I learn from it? Well, science, of course, is all about things we don't understand. It, so in science, we're accustomed to un uncertainty. So it's not difficult for me to, to deal with uncertainty. That, uh, that's how I make a living. And, and uh, when, it, when you're sure about something, it becomes boring. And so, so we like to be also on the edge of truth, but not yet achieving truth. In the case of climate, of course, there's plenty of uncertainty. And most of the, so the experts, of course, are well aware of that. And so they are mostly interested in the many things we don't understand, and particularly the the effects of carbon dioxide on the weather, the, the, these are very interesting problems for science. Unfortunately, the, the thing has become so political uh, uh, that it's no longer science. When you have strong political dogmas, on, as you say, on both sides, uh, then so the methods of science don't work anymore. You have to make up your own mind. And so I can't tell you how to do that. If I, were, if I told you how to do it, I wouldn't be a scientist. And You're saying there might be a problem. What is the solution? We don't yet know. And in the, the, the way to find out is to try many different possibilities and develop new technologies as, as and we have of course huge possibilities still unexplored and particularly in the realm of biology i mean i think to to make energy energy crops is a good idea only we don't yet know how to do it and it, I think it's a big mistake to start subsidizing a technology when it's expensive that sort of fixes it in a, it becomes then a vested interest to continue the technology even when it's expensive and that's not going to solve the problem. What we need is cheap technologies which will pay for themselves. Of course, they're too expensive to be sustainable. So it remains to be seen what will work. Uh, I, th I would say let's go on with solar energy is probably in the end the winner, but not yet. It's, it's still too expensive. and So we, we just have to continue pushing with many different possibilities if that's what you want to do. Of course, I also happen to believe that carbon dioxide on balance is good, so I think the whole, the whole enterprise doesn't really make sense. But what do you think, what should be the action? I would say as little as possible that, I mean, um, to try to dictate technology polit by politics is not good. and. That's what the, the climate people would like to do. So sort of they'd like to have a political control of technology. There are a lot of scientists who, are, who do not feel the obligation to listen to you. Right. How, how come? It's still more important to belong to the tribe than it is to speak the truth. And so I think that explains a great deal. That, and scientists are not different from other people. We have our tribes also. And so this belief in global warming is a cause. It's, 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 it is a tribal loyalty, which is very strong. And 
it's always difficult for the heretic to find people to believe what he's saying. And, but still, heretics are also important. And luckily, they are not burned at the stake anymore. And <laughs> Thank God. <laughs>